All right, it is 1.30. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our last block of presentations for the ASNA virtual conference. Um, this block has two presentations and it is focusing on collaboration. So we will go ahead and get started. And there is a question about um, high body weight, if Dr. Ward or Courtney are still on, if one of y'all would like to answer that in the chat, that would be great. Um, I will go ahead and get started with the next presentation, Collective Impact of the 1890s Multi-State Community. Hello, uh, can my video not show? Do I need to leave it on? Um, is it not letting you? Uh, -uh I said, can I start your video because the host has stopped. Me. Okay, I'll I'll ask Don. Will be able to fix that. So you can go ahead and get started, and then we'll put in the chat when you when it's fixed. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ebony Lott. I am the area specialist for Tennessee State University. Um, and this is our multi-state conference. Um, that we collaborated with um, University of Arkansas. Thank you. <clears throat> that we collaborated with University of Arkansas. Um, and so that's who we started with, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, um, Alabama in, um, Extension Service. Uh, we started this in probably about 2019, so I'll be kind of speaking for everyone today. Next uh, slide, please. And so the conference was really started. Um, my co-worker and I was um, wanted to educate our program assistant, our educators. Uh, we know that they are not able to um, go to many professional development trainings. So we were trying to find a way to educate them because of um, lack of funding and um, just different opportunities for them to improve their different skills and techniques. Um, and also to represent a black a representation of being seen um, by some of our educators too. So we wanted to have this conference to kind of address that. Next slide. So the role started um, in 2019, we was at the ASNA conference. Um, our former director, uh, Leslie Henderson, she introduced me to um, Dr. Morris and Dr. Teresa Henson, um, one from Alabama, one from Arkansas. Um, and that's how the planning started. Um, and then in 2021, we launched our first annual uh, multi-state health fair um, conference. And then 2022, um, each year we have a different host. So the first year, of course, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee State University, we hosted it. Um, and then we also um, chose a food pantry, which I get into more details. Um, uh, so each time, each year, a different university will host it, and then they'll be able to kind of choose their own uh, pantry or food pantry, but we can be able to make all those donations too. Um, and then uh, last year was um, Arkansas. They hosted it too as well. Next slide, please. So this was the first year. Um, my committee was kind of small. Um, because so, we were first starting out. So, of course, we had Dr. Morris, myself, um, Dana, um, Teresa, Marion, Benika, Debbie, and we had Dr. Shea on our first year. Um, we had a couple of more uh, Tennessee State people, too, as well, who helped organize um, and kind of form all the, the agenda creating, with creating the website, um, creating the Facebook page, um, and just putting in the work and effort to to make this conference um, come come alive. Well, at first we thought we were gonna try to do um, in person, but uh, the pandemic hit, hit, uh, hit. So then we decided to do virtual and plus um, it saves on funds again as well. Next slide. So this is our website that we created, um, the 1890s Multi-State Conference. Um, if you go on there now, it does uh it does a rewind of like 21, 22, 23. Um, and we will talk about the walk across the 1890s. Um, that is our PSE and our pre um conference. And we do virtual lightness talk. 
Um, that first year we had interactivity to as well through um, Kahoot, Sketch, Facebook. Um, and the first year we donated to the Mid-South Food Bank. Next slide. Year two, this was Alabama A&M University. So Dr. Andrew Morris uh, was the lead on this one. Um, and as you see, we added each year, we kind of add more people from that hosting university. Uh, so we got more Alabama um, A&M University extension people on for the committee. Uh, we still had our main people for TSU. Um, and then this year, um, that year we added University of Maryland Eastern Shores to this one. Dr. Zumnu. Next slide. Again, um, once we add, this is just a rewind of the conference. We had different speakers that year for breakout sessions. Um, even we had some political people come on and speak to during the panel sessions. Um, and we still did the walk across the 1890s as well. And so these are some of our speakers, our opening speaker, our ending speaker too as well. And some of our um, breakout sessions. Next slide. Year three, this was University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, Dr. Teresa Hintz. She was the lead in this. And so she added her, more of her people on here for the committee. Um, so some of uh, Alabama A&M um, people kind of dropped off a little bit um, and some of our people dropped off. And then uh, Dr. Zumnu, um, some of her people were added a little bit too as well. Next slide. And then this is uh, just a re <laughs> I don't think that on the video. Uh, so this one is just um, the conference recap. Again, if you go to the website, you'll see all the conference uh, recap of each year. Next slide, please. So each year we wanted to have an activity to get the people excited about the conference. So we did a walk across the 1890s. Um, we started off, it was just an eight week program. We kind of modeled it after we have a program here in Tennessee called Walk Across the Tennessee. Um, walk Across the 1890s first started with just the um, three institutions. Um, it was Walk Across from Tennessee, Arkansas, and Alabama. Um, you can do it individually or you can do it as a team. So as you see, year one, we had over um, 100 people um, to participate, um, 19 teams and 29 individuals. And all together, they walked 10,163.13 miles. Next slide. Um, year two, this was uh, year two that we did the walk across the 1890s again. Um, this time we added the University of Maryland of Eastern Shore, so we made it um, 10 weeks this time, and instead uh, it went from doing 890 miles to 1290 miles. And this year, um, we this year we also include like different um, statements too as well from some of the participants. And so you'll see uh, Dr. Teresa Henson, um, some of her statement that she, she had, and we posted these on our face, Facebook page and everything. Next slide. So these are just some of the highlights um, from 2022. Again, um, this was from, I think this 22. So they walked 17,617 miles, 101 participants. And again, they were interacting on the Facebook page. Next slide, please. 2023, um, we're still, we kept it still the same. Um, we added some more instant. Nope, not that you we had any more institutions, um, but we still kept it the same. Um, it was a little lower, but that's okay. Um, 71 participants, still a good number, and they walked 8,350 miles. So they did still um, do an outstanding job of walking. Next slide, please. And also with the conference, because um, we're trying to fight, our mission is to fight food insecurity in each state. Um, so we also do, we set up, it don't run through us. Uh, we have it run through the, either the food bank or the food pantry. So each year the host choose one. Um, and in lieu of, um, the conference is free, but in lieu of the registration fee, we ask that every participant to donate $10. 
Um, so each food bank that you see here or food pantry, uh, they'll set up a link um, and the petition will be able to donate directly towards them. So the first year we was able to get $2,004. Um, the next year, 1800 and then um, last year, 2200 And again, all that went towards um, the food bank. Each one, one in Memphis, one in North Alabama, and then the last one was Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Next slide, please. And then uh, we also have a signing option too, and all those funds go towards the food bank too. So whoever wins um, in, in the auction, we ask them, we'll give them the food bank link. And so they'll be able to um, make their payment through there. And then we'll mail off their, um, the prize that they won. Next slide. Um, so the lesson learned here was for each, each state, again, it provides opportunities for the educators. And even though it's called the 1890s Multi-State Community Nutrition Education Conference, um, the conference is for all the educators. Um, it give the educators, I was an educator before. Um, I started off as a program assistant. Um, and so I know how it is of not being able to um, attend professional development training. And you would like maybe to attend one. So it gives them the opportunity to be able to attend a training. And also it gives them the opportunity to, to do breakout sessions and um, be on panels and be able to to tell their experiences and um, their opinions of what's going on. And it shows the other educators in other states too, as well, and other counties, um, what, what they are doing. And maybe they'll be able to do that in their state and also collaborate or even help them out. Um, because we all, uh, we all need a little help um, sometimes of implementing these programs. So um, I think each state can say that um, their educators um, do get good lesson, good topics, um, the opportunity to um, kind of socialize with other educators, um, ask different questions to help them out in their program, in their state, or in their, their county. Next slide. For the future, um, we are kind of rephrasing, kind of, um, we kind of redeveloping it because we have lost a couple of people. It's still going to be the same way we have added four new um, institutions to the 1890s multi-state, but now we're in developing a logo for the for the conference. And we're trying to make sure that every institution, no matter if you're 1890s, 1862, 1994, no matter if you're an organization who teaches nutrition classes, that you are able to attend this conference. You are able to do lightning talks. Um, and lightning talks is just, uh, just like what we're doing right here, a simple little presentation. Um, where you are, you present one of your ideas and it gets run through the conference. So we are trying to market and um, get everyone to um, attend more. Next slide. So we will, have an, we will be having our annual conference again this year. Next slide. Yes, uh, it is May the 15th, 16th. Um, of this year, um, you can scan the code, um, or if you'd like more information, I'd be happy to send it out. Um, again, the conference is free. We just ask for you to donate um, to the food pantry um, of the um, Dr. Zunu Choice uh, for this year. Next slide. And then this is the, the donation link to as well. Any questions? Thank you, Ebony. That was awesome. That, what a cool like event and experience for the nutrition educators. That's really awesome. Um, there is one question in the Q&A. How long would you say it took for you to plan the first conference that you offered? Oh, uh, We started in 2019. Like I said, it was the idea at first <laughs> between one of my coworkers here at the office in the county office. Um, and then I carried it to our state team. So we started in 2019. We started planning then. Um, we were switching from ideas of just doing a project. Then it turns it turned into a conference. And then we didn't launch our first conference into 2021. And again, that took a team effort. Um, she's not on here today, but um, thanks all to our team who 
who helped special Marion. Um, she created our website. She created our Facebook page <clears throat> for registration. Um, we do a Quatches link for registration um, for the walk across. We still do the Quatches link. We first started out with a Google um, Doc um, link, um, but we found out that it didn't work for everybody. So that's why we just went to the Quatches link. So it took about two years to kind of plan and make sure everything ran right. And then also you have to make sure, you know, technology is funny. So you have to make sure your technology is working in the background. And then since we, it is virtually, you have to just consistently and stay on people of like sending presentations, um, <clears throat> sending a bio and everything. Cause everything is on our Facebook page, um, doing the agenda, um, sketch, we do sketch too, just, um, just like I think, um, just like some of the other conference, so um, it takes it, it takes a lot. So we try to plan a year in advance. Once we finish in May, we give every time everybody a little time to kind of recuperate. Um, probably maybe about in June or July, we'll talk about um the conference that happened in May, and then probably about maybe September, October, we'll start on the next year. It's a long process planning events like this. <laughs> it, it is. It's worked it in the end. At first, you think it's not going to come together, and then everything comes together, and the um, educators um, love it. Yeah. There's two more quick questions. Um, you are you the contact for more information about the planning or participation? I am. You can contact me. Yes. Okay. And then, was this completely SNAPED funded, or were the or were there FNET funds also used for this? How were the expenses split between universities? Um, <laughs> most of it is covered probably by SNAP aid funds. Um, no, no FNET funds. Um, and stuff. Um, uh, as far as split, um, most of the TSU covers uh, most of the stuff and everything. We cover we cover sketch um the website and stuff like that and you just put it in your state plan every year yes we put it in our state plan to make sure um that it's approved so anything that um we cover is uh we just put it in the state plan and everything and then somebody did ask for your email so i'll ask you just to type that answer um to them in the q and a and then dawn can also put it in the chat as well we will go ahead and move on to the next one. Thank you so much, Ebony. We appreciate you. And it was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Thank you for the opportunity. Too. Yes, thank you. All right. I will move on to Joanne um, with collaborating with the community and agency partners to improve nutrition security, connecting DC residents with federal nutrition programs and a novel eligibility estimator tool our last presentation of the conference. Go ahead, Joanne. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me and, and thank you everyone for uh, sticking around for this last presentation. Um, Ebony, thank you for your wonderful presentation. So uh, today I'm, uh, well, first, hello, my name is Joanne Jolly and um, I'm here on behalf of my teammate, Lauren Marr, who really led this project but couldn't be here today. Um, I serve as a division chief within DC Department of Health's Nutrition and Physical Fitness Bureau, overseeing our healthy eating and active living division. Our division oversees nutrition education, food access, physical activity, and built environment interventions, and we serve as the state implementing agency for SNAP-Ed here in the district. Today, I have the pleasure of talking about a resource that our state nutrition action, action council, our SNAC, came together um, to develop. Um, so next slide. A little bit about what I'll be covering today. I'll, I'll just be talking about some demographic information about our state, the goals and purpose of the toolkit, uh, the original document that was created, the process that we went through to update it and, and how uh, we use it, as well as our digital estimator tool. Um, so before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about the district for those who are not uh, familiar. Uh, the burden of obesity is not evenly distributed across the district's population, racial, economic, and 
um, neighborhood disparities in obesity really persist. So the district has one of the lowest obesity rates in the entire nation. Um, however, at, at 24.3%, which is, is quite low um, when looking nationally, but the prevalence of obesity among Black and Hispanic adult residents is significantly higher than that of white residents at 39.2% and 26.5% respectively. The trend is similar for income levels among district residents and then neighborhood disparities are more severe with a fourfold difference between Ward 2 and Ward 8. So our, dis our uh, the state is um, broken down into eight geographic wards. And um, if you guys see on Ward 2, that kind of straight line that delineates the National Mall where um, the monuments, White House, are all kind of there. Um, it's also where Georgetown is, if you're familiar with the area. This is, um, as I was saying, uh, one of the lowest obesity rates compared to Ward 8, a neighboring ward um, east of the river, which has um, an obesity rate of almost 44%. Uh, the trend is similar with uh, chronic diseases um, and also access to food. There are 76 full-service grocery stores across our state. Um, and these stores are definitely not evenly distributed. Um, wards one through six have at least nine full grocery stores in each ward, um, while ward eight just has one full service grocery store. And, and we refer to this as the grocery gap. So that's uh, around 160,000 residents um, with just access to one full service grocery store. So the next slide, please. So um, many of you may know what a federal nutrition program is. Um, but federal nutrition programs promote food security and healthier, healthier dietary behaviors. Um, and we know that connecting people with federal nutrition programs can help reduce food insecurity and ensure that our residents have the nutrition needed to live a healthy and productive life. So um, the District of Columbia's snack is made up of all of our federal nutrition program providers. So agencies that implement these programs, which include the Department of Aging and Community Living, our Office of, on the State Superintendent of Education, um, as well as our uh, SNAP uh, outreach organization, DC Hunger Solutions. So um, during the pandemic, as many states did, we scrambled to ensure that residents had information to food access resources. Um, and so all of the agencies that uh, implement federal nutrition programs convened and created a toolkit with the purpose of helping residents find food resources, particularly these, the federal programs. Um, furthermore, we wanted to develop a, a resource that would be easy to understand and easy to utilize um, with things changing so quickly in the pandemic and also just historically federal nutrition programs being difficult for folks to navigate. Our goal was really um, to create a resource that was straightforward, plain, easy to understand. Next slide. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the original toolkit um, and the process that we have gone through to update it. Um, but as I said, out of the pandemic, pandemic was born our first toolkit. Um, and we spent the last year looking at really does the toolkit achieve its goals? And are there any changes that can be made to increase its ability to achieve its goals? So this is the original toolkit. It's beautiful. Um, as you can see, uh, it's a partnership between, like I said, DC Hunger Solutions, um, DC Health, our who houses SNAP Ed, um, Department of Human Services, which is our SNAP agency, SNAP implementing agency, the Department of Aging and Community Living, and Office of the State Superintendent. And the original toolkit um, is a PDF file. It's over 20 pages. And um, the way that we group the food programs is by age groups. Um, so someone could say, okay, I have a child between the ages of two to five. These are the federal nutrition programs that my child may be eligible for. And then if you look here on the right, this is what a page looked like. A lot of white space, brief discussion on what the benefit is, who is eligible, how you can apply, 
and then contact information. And we were really, um, really deliberate in putting in a phone number that we knew someone would answer um, as feedback that we regularly hear is that people feel that um, government organizations are difficult to reach. Um, so this was the original toolkit. It was great, but as you can imagine, a 20 plus page resource is cumbersome to print and give out. Um, so really the most, it was most accessible online, but we know that folks, we might not be reaching the folks that, that we wanted to be using it if we kind of house it online somewhere. Um, so we set out to evaluate it. Uh, first, we did a literature review. We looked at all of the states across the nation to see who was providing information around federal nutrition programs and how were they providing that information. Um, then we spoke to residents. We spoke to uh, WIC participants, participants in staff ed programs, participants in commodity supplemental food program. Um, and we also spoke to uh, community-based organizations that were helping residents navigate food access programs, um, healthcare providers, um, and allied health professionals. We took all of that information uh, to update our toolkit, and then we did user testing to ensure that the um, material that we created really met the need that we were looking to meet. So, next slide. Um, so the results of our resident and community feedback um, sessions were this. Uh, people loved the layout. They thought that um, organized by age group was really helpful. So they knew exactly where they needed to go. Um, but they felt that the information was still, even though we felt it was succinct, a little long-winded. Um, folks regularly said that they didn't know the resources existed. Um, so I think that happens a lot. We had a state agency create a resource we think is great. Um, but it's not reaching the target population. Um, we also noted the need to translate it. Um, we ensured that uh, the writing was at an accessible reading level, um, that paper format, people still want paper. We still um, need to be printing and giving things out. Um, and that's something to help people, if a digital um, tool to help people navigate programs online would be helpful too. So we took all this feedback and looked at our toolkit and redesigned it. So slide. Um, so what's new? Instead of having one very big toolkit of all the programs, we designed eight singular brochures that were grouped by common age group. And um, we translated them into the top uh, seven languages spoken in the district. We have them available through the District of Columbia Health Department's website, through our WIC website, and through our partner DC Hunger Solutions website. And then we developed a digital estimator tool that could help easily connect residents with programs. Um, our And the programming was updated to reflect FY24. Next slide. This is what they look like. Um, so, like I said, eight different brochures by age group. This really helped, especially with community-based organizations that may serve only one subset of folks, right? Like if we're working in an early child care setting, older adults age 60 plus might not be information that they need. Um, so we can target our outreach in this way. Next slide. Um, and this is what it looks like inside. Um, so we have uh, the purpose of the toolkit, how to use it, um, on, on the right, you'll see the different um, programs that this person might be eligible for based on their um, age group. We kept this as succinct as possible and also as, as um, brief and vague as possible. We didn't want, the second you create a, a paper something, it goes out of date. So we wanted to have something that was would stand the test of time um, and only needed to be updated with drastic program changes. Um, we kept the contact information with a direct phone number, emails, websites. Um, and then also we have a link to our eligibility estimator, as well as a link to Link U DMV, which is uh, an online community resource hub that we have here in the district that provides information around um, food, health, housing, and other social services. Next slide. 
Um, and then, of course, this digital estimator tool, um, this is a 10 question survey that provides potential federal nutrition program eligibility. Um, we we have a disclaimer at the beginning of, of the toolkit that it is simply your potential eligibility. So um, we ask kind of 10 questions that are general enrollment questions, such as like age, income, other programs that you might be eligible for. And through that, um, we're able to determine programs a person may be eligible for. They receive uh, a document with information on how to learn more emailed to them. Um, and click the next slide, I think, yeah, picture. Yep, so it's very uh, simple, plain language, and I'm happy to put the link in the chat for it. Um, and this also provides us uh, a, an opportunity to um, evaluate who's using it. We included demographic data that is optional to answer around the hunger vital signs, chronic disease rates, or if you're filling this out on behalf of someone, if you're from a community-based organization. Next slide. Um, so we've been kind of on a roadshow here at DC SNAPED talking about this toolkit, training providers, community health workers, nutrition educators, anyone who works with anyone on how to use the eligibility estimator and how to um, how to give out uh, these toolkits. We have them in the libraries here in the district um, and, and other, other pla uh, common places that people might visit so that they can uh, pick up and, and learn more about it. Slide. It's 202. Well, uh, right on time. Um, happy to drop the, this information in the chat. And um, if you have more questions, I'm also happy to answer them. Thank you, Joanne. That was great. I definitely want to talk to y'all online because we were, try we're trying to do something similar with our snack and I don't think they can envision it. So this would be very helpful. <laughs> so I will definitely be contacting both of you guys <laughs> offline. Um, are there any questions? Oh, we just got one. All right. Do you have any idea whether referrals or usage of, uh, I think, programs, particularly underused programs, changes? Are there actually different audiences for compendium versus population focus? Would an organization serving mixed groups prefer everything in one place versus more pop population specific brochures? It's a great question, Susan, and um, we hosted a few focus groups with clinicians and community health workers and community-based organizations to ask this specific question, is separate, um, are separate brochures helpful for you or is one document more helpful for you? Um, and what we heard was uh, separate brochures is really what, what people asked for because they work more with targeted populations. However, since releasing the toolkit after we did all of this feedback, we have had requests for maybe like a one pager. Um, so that's kind of on our docket to do this year. It's a lot of programs to put in one place. So that's really been, been our holdup of not having too much information. Um, but that that's kind of where we're working on now is to have one kind of master one sheet that can refer people to, to these programs. Um, do you have any idea whether referrals or usage of programs? Um, if you mean if this uh, resource is helping with referrals or usage of programs, um, we don't have any data on that yet as this was just released here in January, but it is something that we're tracking. Uh, we, although not all of our nutrition programs are, are referral based, for instance, like, um, school nutrition programs, uh, but things like the Commodity Supplemental Food Program or here the DC WIC program, we do have online referral forms and um, there's an option to select how you heard about it. So that's one way that we plan on evaluating the usage if, if folks were referred through this toolkit option. Great. Oh, yeah. And we can definitely link them in the chat one more time. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing anything. I'm gonna give it one more, a couple more seconds, because right when I say that, some something always pops up. I swear. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, I think we're good. If there's any other questions, um, Joanne's contact information is right there. So you can feel free to follow up with her via email. Um, but with that, thank you, Joanne. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. Like I said, I will definitely be in touch myself um, to talk to you all further about it. So thank you so much. All right. So that concludes our ASMA virtual conference. We are just five minutes over. I am very proud we were able to pretty much stay on time today. Um, please go ahead and take the conference evaluation. The link is here and I believe Dawn is going to put it in the chat. We appreciate each and every one of our presenters today and yesterday. It was a great two days of presentations. We are so thrilled that everybody was willing to do this. And with all the attendees, thank you so much for being here, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, the recording of yesterday's presentations, as well as all of today, will be on the ASNA website um, by the end of the month, as well as copies of the PowerPoints will also be on the ASNA website. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. But other than that, Dawn, unless you have anything else to add, I believe that's it. So thank you so much for being here today. And we appreciate you all and hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks everyone for joining.